Welcome to Make Ready TV, where the world's firearms professionals teach you one-on-one. -on -one. I'm Kyle, standing in for Matt, who's in South Africa hunting the elusive white striped mouse. And I'm Kaylee Jeans. In our tactical training segment, we are going to Alliance, Ohio to check in with Pat Rogers at the shoot house. In our self-defense training segment, we're going to go to ISA and Stark and review some driving techniques. And in our third segment, we're going to Masad Ayub and going over frequently asked questions in deadly force. And for our pro tip segment, we're gonna hear from Dean Caputo, Paul Howe, and James Williams. And now let's check in with Pat Rogers. Striped field mouse, really? That's what he said on the phone. Proper prior planning prevents piss poor performance. This is especially true when we're going inside to do battle with somebody in the structure. Close quarter combat is defined as surgical shooting. And if we don't have our guns and our equipment up, we're gonna be on the ragged edge of the power curve. We have a procedure that we utilize in order to make sure that we do it the same way each and every time. Guys, make ready. Check your eyes and your ears. Once you're satisfied with that, go ahead and fully load your pistol. When you draw it, do it like you mean it, like it's your job. If you cycle that, make sure you digitally check that, the press check, stick your finger in there. Remember, we're working in the dark sometimes. Make sure you tackle that pistol before you put it away. Get your rifle up and running. Put it up in your workspace. Find a magazine. Touch that top round with your finger. Remember, we're working in the dark. Put it in with a push-pull. Make sure you pull on it. Cycle that action. Take that magazine out. Feel for the top round. If it's shifted, Merry Christmas. You have one in the chamber. Put it back in with a push-pull. Make sure you pull on it. After you've done that, touch the bolt face to make sure it's in battery. Close the dust cover. Ensure that rifle's on safe. Take a look through your optic. Check your rheostat, make sure it's bright enough. If you're satisfied with that, check all your lights, your sights, and your lasers. Check all your lights, your secondary and your tertiary lights. If we do it the same way each and every time, it makes life a lot easier for us. A lot of people don't like to make ready this way because they feel they're too cool to train, they've been around too long, and they know what they're doing. And those same people go into the shoot house and wind up with empty guns or lights that don't work. Guys, we need to be sure. Parachute riggers have a motto, we will be sure always. We want to be sure always too. We use reactive targets inside the shoot house. The reason for it is we want the feedback. We want to make sure the students understand that when they press the trigger, we're trying to put somebody down. We're not shooting at a piece of paper. We're shooting at simulated humanoids. We use action targets for a simple reason. Uh, they come pre-made. We put a balloon inside there, run a piece of string up, hang it on the uh, wall. When a projectile hits this, it pops and it falls down. Down range, we have two targets. I'm going to shoot the first target, the bright red target, on the left with an NSR. An NSR is five, six, seven rounds. I'm going to shoot the guy straight to the ground. One of the problems we see inside the shoot house is guys will come in and they'll fire a standard drill. That is two rounds and then walk away from the target. It's not what we're going to do. We're going to engage this target until it goes down. So it'll look something like this.
I'll come over to the second target and I'll shoot a failure drill on him. I'll try to take it down with the pair to the body. If it doesn't go down, I'll shoot it. I will fire a single shot to the brain. So it'll look like this. What we want to do is make sure we're shooting these guys to the ground. Just putting projectiles into somebody doesn't necessarily mean you're going to hurt them. Just because you hurt them doesn't mean you're going to kill them. Just because you kill them doesn't mean you're going to kill them right now. What we have to do is incapacitate the threat. We have to do it immediately. When we have two targets close together, we're faced with a dilemma. We'd like to shoot one target to the ground, but if we do that, the second target may be shooting us to the ground. So what we'll do here is a box drill. Box drill is simply this. We'll put a hammer in the body of the first target, a hammer in the body of the second target. Then we'll just drive that gun straight up the spine till we reach his brain, shoot the second target in the brain, and move back to the first target, and end him. It'll look like this. Yeah. Make Ready TV is brought to you by FNH USA, Smith & Wesson, TNVC, and Pro Ears. I think those reactive targets from LE targets are great, and they give you instant feedback. Yeah, and if they don't, keep shooting until they do. Now let's go to ISA in Stark, Florida, and review driving tactics. Now we're going to talk about the pit maneuver. Depending on where you go, there's a couple different names it's called. A precision immobilization technique or a pursuit intervention technique. Regardless of what you say, the technique is still the same. Right now we're going to practice this on loose surface. It's a technique that's executed with finesse. You need to be smooth on the execution of this. It's not a ramming technique. There's not a whole lot of damage that can be caused to the vehicles if it's done correctly. We have these custom bumpers put on these vehicles right now for training purposes. You can execute this technique without these kinds of bumpers and still be able to preserve your vehicle in order to proceed where you need to go without damaging it to the extent to where it renders it inoperable. To execute the pit maneuver, I've set these vehicles up with the way it should look upon execution. You want the front quarter panel in front of the tire to impact the rear quarter panel behind the tire. If you get too far forward, the fenders can get hung up on each other depending on what kind of bumper system is involved in the vehicle. A pit maneuver doesn't have to be done at high speeds, especially on loose surface. Doesn't take much speed at all. On a harder surface such as asphalt, takes a little bit more speed to execute it in order to break the traction. There are certain surfaces you don't want to execute a pit maneuver on. It'll cause more damage than necessary to yourself and or the target vehicle and there's safety considerations involved. Gravel surfaces that are loose but have hard traction type areas are not good surfaces to execute a pit maneuver on. You want to make sure you have plenty of room in the area and that you have complete control of your vehicle. Focus on your target, focus on what's beyond the target, any obstructions from side to side, along with any pedestrians. Now let's step into the vehicles and see how it's done. Okay, now what I'm gonna do here is, I've got my target vehicle, so I'm gonna ease up to it. I use a little bit of left foot braking to ease up, and then as I make my contact here, then I brake the traction and commit. A key point to remember is full commitment. Once you make up your mind to make it happen, you have to commit in order for it to be executed properly. And like I mentioned before, keep in mind your observation arc. You need to be looking around you to see what's around to make sure you have a good area to pit your target. Safety for yourself and innocent passers-by 
is key and paramount when taking another vehicle out of action. Okay, we're gonna accelerate using proper throttle modulation. Looking ahead, my observation arc. Set it up, finesse, and execute. Also notice, takes very little steering input to execute this technique when done properly. Okay, now we're pitting on asphalt, which is a lot harder surface. It's going to take a little bit more speed and effort to make the pit. So let's see how it goes here this first time. Still need to maintain your situational awareness, your good observation. Good steering control, throttle modulation, finesse. and follow through. Okay, so we got a hard surface of asphalt. We're gonna maintain our throttle modulation. It's a finesse technique, so we're gonna ease up beside it. We're gonna put our front fender to his rear fender and execute. I agree with Russ. You gotta be smooth when you're doing pit maneuvers. Yeah, you should see my skills in Los Angeles. Amazing. They're amazing. Now let's go to Masad Ayub. Hey gang, my name is Masad Ayub. I've been asked to talk to you today about deadly force. Uh, my background, real quick, uh, started carrying a gun at an unusually young age and got old doing it. St uh, 38 and a half years now in law enforcement as a sworn officer. Don't place any expertise on that because I did it part time, but I sure did learn a lot doing it. 25 of those years was as a police prosecutor. In our state, if the department picks you out for it, they send you to the academy for a two-week cram course and throw you into the pit against real defense lawyers prosecuting violations and misdemeanors. Uh, among other things, that's where I learned the value of plea bargaining. Became an expert witness in 1979, and I've been doing that uh, fairly frequently since. Uh, most recently, testifying 10 days ago in a murder trial in West Virginia. And yes, we won the acquittal. So basically, I've been on both sides of that street. Been teaching firearms to law enforcement since 1972 and to private citizens since 1981. Thirty-some years ago, I wrote a book on it called In the Gravest Extreme, subtitled The Role of the Firearm in Personal Protection. Some people were kind enough to call it the authoritative text on civilian use of deadly force. I've been teaching that topic for many years now. In a short video, I can't give you what I'd give you in a 20-hour course. So what we're going to try to do here is answer some of the most frequently encountered questions on this very often misunderstood topic. First question, what exactly is deadly force? Deadly force or lethal force, the terms are interchangeable, means that degree of force that a reasonable, prudent person would expect to cause death or great bodily harm. States have different definitions of great bodily harm, but as a rule of thumb nationwide, it would mean a crippling or devastating injury. Questions asked, what makes the use of deadly force justifiable? Universally, in all 50 states, it would be a situation of immediate and otherwise unavoidable danger of death or great bodily harm to you 
or to someone you had the right to protect. Now, how are you expected to determine if that situation exists, that situation of immediate, otherwise unavoidable danger of death or great bodily harm to an innocent party? Basically, there's a three-pronged test. And different schools, uh, different teachers will use different terms for it. But the most common terms are ability, opportunity, and jeopardy. Now, let's break those down. The ability factor means the opponent possesses the power to kill or to cripple. Most commonly, most obviously, that'll be the, the man coming at you has a, a weapon, per se, a, a gun, a knife, a club, a broken bottle, or whatever. But it can also be what's called disparity of force, and we'll get to that shortly. Basically, disparity of force would mean within the totality of the circumstances, a, a buzz phrase you encounter constantly in law, that if his unarmed attack on you continued, it would be so likely to kill or cripple you or the person you're protecting, that his ability to do that becomes the equivalent of a deadly weapon, and that justifies your use of a lethal weapon in response. So ability means he has the power to kill or to cripple. The second element is opportunity. Opportunity means he's capable of immediately employing that power. If he's 50 yards away aiming a rifle at me, he most certainly does have that opportunity. If he's twice that distance, let's say a football field away, and he's waving a knife and threatening to kill me, well, his threats indicate to me an intent to cause great bodily harm or death. He's wielding a deadly weapon, but the opportunity element is missing. It's gonna take him a while to cover those 100 yards, during that time, I can create even more distance. I can perhaps put obstacles between him and me or perhaps take other recourse. Might be a great time to draw your gun proactively, but it would not yet be time to shoot if all the other man has is a contact weapon that he has to touch you with to harm you. The final element is jeopardy. Jeopardy means he's acting in such a way that reasonable, prudent people would conclude he intended to kill or cripple you or the person you're acting to protect. Uh, essentially, it's manifest intent. It means intent that is manifested by words and or actions. Moss has been an expert on the use of deadly force for quite some time. He definitely knows what he's talking about. Yes. And now for some pro tips, let's go to Dean Caputo, James Williams, and Paul Howe. The Make Ready TV Pro Tips are presented by Battle Comp Enterprises. This one's for the ladies. I've had some really good feedback from women that I've trained in edge weapon defense. Remember, the tool empowers you. It helps to equalize things. You guys have a whole lot of inner emotional power especially, and actually more ferocity in sheer ferocity than the men do. That's why God made us bigger to make it even. So spend some time with this, ladies. You can do it. You can protect yourself. You can protect your children. Okay? Learn to use these edge weapons. Carry one with you. They're extremely valuable, and you'll feel a lot better for it. Ammunition manufacturers recommend that you don't run auto-loading ammunition through a, a weapon system more than twice. I like to not load the same ammunition in my AR-15 more than once. If you've racked that round through the weapon system, one, we know that you've already dimpled the primer, two, the round has already gone through the feeding cycle and has either scarred up or marked the bullet tip. I see people regularly who run the same rounds over and over again through their weapon system and put them back in the magazine. If you actually fire those rounds, you're going to find that the weapon system is very inaccurate with those rounds and sometimes you can even have a dead round from all the impacts of the uh, floating firing pin impacting the primer. It's just a good idea to run that round through once. When you're done and unloading the weapon after whatever happened, don't put that same round back in the weapon system again. All right, we want to talk about a couple problems I've seen out there. I use muzzle caps. I keep my, my muzzle plug with a muzzle cap, keep it protected. When I see people that don't use muzzle caps, this will happen, and don't try this at home, is they may get their flash suppressor. That's not enough sand. We'll put a little bit right in there. And what happens is it plugs it up. 
What I've seen is not bad up close, but at distance you'll lose that first shot. It'll blow right out. What I'm going to do is I'm going to shoot this just to show you. Now, it shouldn't cause a problem up close. So, how I fix that, I put a muzzle cap on. Muzzle caps are meant to be shot off. I can come in here into the sand. It won't affect my barrel. And when I come up, I'm going to engage this target right now. It blows right off. Sometimes it sticks like that. We'll try another round. Oh, it's still there. But I've shot these off at 100 yards, tap rounds, soft points, hollow points. It doesn't hurt the bullet. It basically blows right out, and it protects you from losing that first shot. So again, where will we lose it? Well, we manipulate people. Well, we do medical. Now, I see a lot of times the muzzles go into the sand. I used to carry several of these in my pocket, so after an action, I could go ahead, pull it off, put another one right back on. Make Ready TV is brought to you by Brownells, The SIG Academy, Rand Innovations, and Core Bond. I've seen guys run ammo through their carbine over and over and over, and I got to agree with Dean, just don't do it. And Paul Howe had some great tips about those muzzle caps. I agree, and I liked what James had to say about women and knives. For more one-on-one -on -one training with our instructors, either via streaming video or DVD, make sure and check out our website at MakeReadyTV.com. And we'll see you next week. The Make Ready DVDs are available from Brownells.com. And for our pro tip segment, we're going to hear from James Caput. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> Told you, you did this on purpose. I know it. This is actually not from us. Uh, we didn't want to forget <laughs> from our dear friend Louis Arabach. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In fact, it's autographed. Yeah. Well, too bad. You know what? At the end of the day, when I talk, my lips move. <laughs> Combat leprechaun, man. Combat leprechaun.